Okay, I guess we'll get started. Ruth, do you want, you have a few things you want to say? Yeah, I have yeah so for everyone who doesn't know me, I, I thank you for coming online today. And I'm Ruth Jensen. I'm the director of the College of the Redwoods Art Gallery. And so this past month, um, I've had the pleasure of emailing and working with Linda to organize and prepare Trouble Under the Big Trees for virtual display. And so some of you, I assume, have probably seen the exhibit. And if you haven't yet, I definitely encourage you to view it. It's on the College of the Redwoods Art Gallery website, which is redwoods.edu slash art gallery. And I'll be sure to put that link in the chat for everyone in case you want to go pop over there and see it after the discussion which fortunately, unlike a real gallery, um, it's open all the time. So you can um, look at Linda's work in the virtual gallery that you can go into, walk through, see the art on the walls in this cool virtual display. And it will be in that format until November 13th. So after that, that format will be closed to the public. And um, as gallery director, I also, of course, worked with Linda to um, prepare and open Trouble Under the Big Trees. Um, I also worked um, very closely with our curator of this exhibit. And she and Cindy here definitely served a vital role in organizing and planning and bringing this exhibition to the public to be opened this month. So she's gonna say a few words now. Okay. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much for coming. I have a few prepared remarks <laughs> <laughs> on the topic of Redwoods and also Linda's work. This conversation with artist Linda McDonald is the first in a series of Zoom talks for the College of the Redwoods Creative Arts Gallery. After the talk, there's going to be an opportunity for participants to ask Linda questions. You can either type your questions in the chat box or wait until the end of Linda's talk to ask her directly. Linda McDonald, born in Berkeley, California, now lives in the rural Mendocino County town of Willits. After college and inspired by the Back to the Land movement, McDonald and her artist husband moved to a cabin with acreage in the early 1970s. Over the years, she has taught in universities, colleges, art centers, and high schools, and now maintains a studio in her home. McDonald began her art career as a painter, switched to textiles in the 1980s, and more recently has returned to canvas and paper. She has shown extensively in the US and Japan and has worked in the collection of the White House, the city of San Francisco, the Museum of Art and Design in New York City, the International Quilt Study Center at the University of Nebraska, and in many private collections. Linda's art examines California's coast redwoods, their conservation, appreciation, and stewardship. She works to increase cultural awareness of these magnificent organisms and is also fascinated by the many tourist attractions that cheerfully capitalize on the history and folklore of the great redwood empire. My name is Cynthia Hooper, and I'm a professor of art at College of the Redwoods. Linda and I have both had the unique experience of living and working amid coastal redwoods for decades, and I very much look forward to this presentation of her work. Before we begin this talk, though, I'd like to give our participants some information about coastal redwoods and the contingencies they currently face. Prior to California's invasion of white settlers, Sequoia Sempervirens' historical range spanned coastal forests from Big Sur to the Oregon border, an estimated 2 million acres. Now less than 5% of the, the original forests remain, nearly all of it located in parks and preserves. There are currently 1.5 million acres of second growth forests though, much of it as privately owned working landscapes for timber production or residential development. Coast redwoods are California's most valuable species for timber production. They are a specialty lumber used primarily for decking, fencing, and remodeling instead of for housing construction where cheaper Douglas fir dominates the market. Interestingly, residential development in redwood forests is actually a bigger threat than logging because housing construction permanently alters the forest's ecology. A logged forest can grow back. In addition to well over a century of intensive logging and human incursion, coastal redwoods are now facing threats by climate change. 
Rising temperatures have reduced coastal fog by more than 30% in the last six decades, but coastal redwoods get up to 40% of their water from fog. Their tiny leaves are designed to be fog drip collectors with which they both water themselves and all the organisms that live near them. Less fog means significantly less water for these temperate rainforest ecosystems. Coastal redwoods have a long history of resilience to shifting climactic conditions though, and researchers have recently discovered a lengthy history of climate data embedded in their wood. These core samples tell a story of up to 2000 years of astonishing resistance to periods of drought, heat, and fire. The climate is changing so rapidly now though, the coastal redwood forests will eventually need to move northward to Oregon to seek climate refugia and humans will need to assist them with this migration. As you will see in Linda's talk tonight, Linda's most recent work examines these ancient trees scarring by centuries of fire. Armed with a blanket of up to one foot thick bark, coastal redwoods have natural resistance to wildfire, but the climate driven intensity of recent wildfires are challenging these defenses. Add to that the accumulation of unmanageably large fuel loads from decades of fire suppression in Western US forests. Native peoples of these forests once successfully managed excess fuel loads with widespread cultural burning that attracted game and provided materials for traditional basketry. Reincorporating ancestral forest management practices now could indeed prove effective in mitigating the catastrophic wildfires the West is now facing. Despite their limited geographical distribution, coast redwoods play an outsized role in global climate mitigation. Recent research demonstrates that previously logged redwood forests accumulate biomass more quickly than any forest ever measured. They are extremely effective carbon capture landscapes. Preserving an acre of old growth redwood forest, furthermore, creates the equivalent of taking 700 passenger cars off the road every year. Redwoods are critical for innumerable reasons, and Linda McDonald has made them central to her creative practice for decades. The College of the Redwoods is grateful to Linda for this opportunity to hear more about her work. So with that, I introduce Linda McDonald. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, Cindy. Um, you've really given the background, the science background, so that's really wonderful. Um, but I want to uh, just sort of show what I've done through all these years um, by not showing all of my work at all, but just sort of um, a little bit of um, all the different sort of threads that I have uh, been exploring. And um, I'll talk a little bit about moving to Mendocino County in uh, 1970. And my husband and I had got, were at San Francisco State, and um, I was taking art, of course. And um, there were there was all this <laughs> agitation going on. There were uh, student strikes. Uh, people were they wanted uh, a black studies unit. They wanted um, uh, not women's studies, not yet, but more ethnic studies. And they were also upset about. Um, all the part-time teachers and that there were no full-time uh, African-American teachers or other ethnic teachers. And um, so every day you'd go to school and you didn't know whether you'd be able to go to class or not. So I dropped out and it was the Timothy Leary, you know, tune in and turn on and drop out time. So uh, we wanted to come to live in a place that was uh, a lot closer to nature. So we ended up coming north and finding that there were all these old pieces of property that were really cheap. And um, so we were lucky to buy a cabin, buy property and um, start the you know, back to the land kind of um, experience. And it was like learning all those basic things that you didn't learn when you were a kid you know, canning food and gardening and uh, weaving and spinning and doing plumbing and electrical work. So um, we really worked on that for quite a while. And the local, the property we bought was uh, near Longvale on Covalo Road and um, very isolated. It had been a school called La Rue School. 
um, a one room schoolhouse and then it was an abandoned hunting cabin. So it was really a fun adventure, lots of work too. Um, anyway, the locals sort of thought we were crazy and called us hill people like, what are you, why are you living out there, you know? And, um, you know, our ideal was to work somewhat and then do our art. And that's what we tried to do. But we both ended up in education and, um, you know, had a good career in that. But, um, yeah, so let me put on the slides and start that and I'll talk about them. Oh, let's see. Of course, this is all sort of new to me. Um, this is actually recent from the uh, uh, this, the um, marches in the past couple of years. And I'll show some more of these slides at the very end. But I one of the things that I had learned was quilt making. And, um, you know, that was in my family. It was uh, the women had learned it when they were from, they were from Ohio and from Indiana. And so I grew up with that around me. And with the consciousness raising in the early seventies, it was really uh, fun to see this type of um, activity, but thinking, oh, I'm really working with pattern. I can use this in these and sort of get away from that grid that to me was really confining. So, um, I wanted to sort of punch through that wall and have three dimensional space. And I'm showing this to you because I, I did a lot of painting and making these stitched items, which came to be called art quilts. But I wanted to show you some of my earlier ones. These are really large. This is like a 82 by 82 inches, which was fun to do something that big, but they did take a long time. And this was one of the last ones I did because they would take me about a year. And this is a 10 feet by 11 feet, all uh, hand stitched and uh, appliqued. I did some painting on it because I felt like whatever I needed to do to make this be really what I wanted to, I would just, I could do it with, uh, with textiles and with sewing. Um, and this was a commission, otherwise I wouldn't have made something quite this large. But I soon got into um, airbrushing on fabric and also hand painting and sort of looking around and thinking, what are the stories that are here? Um, and to me, this, this one is about, you're trying to find your perfect place in the country and uh, you look and you look for a couple of years and you want the cabin by the creek and you want the perfect trees and um, you know the a place for the garden and uh, you just don't get that. You, you know, unless you have <laughs> lots and lots of money, you get a cabin that's falling apart that has 30 leaks you know, the very first year and uh, doesn't have a foundation and has rattlesnakes underneath in the summer. And, uh, but you're happy because you're there, you know, and everything is going around and cutting wood that's wet to stuff it in the stove. So, um, you know, I love the imagery of uh, the tree stump and um, the, the saw or the, the ax. And these were done in the eighties. So this was called uh, California Summers and even then, you know, we had fires every summer. And it's just part of the, where are the fires? They never seem to be as close as they are now, nor as large, nor as threatening, but they were definitely there. And uh, this shows how, you know, we have built out into these um, mountains. And uh, even though we're, we're in the town, we're looking out and we see all these little houses and then it's all going to burn. So we've known this for a long time, but you know, we just keep 
doing, working on our path of, uh, of what we are doing, which is, you know, increasing our population, using our um, uh, resources, and I loved airbrush and the sort of soft quality you get with it. It's just really nice. When I was uh, teaching at the high school, uh, there was a, I taught the art classes, um, but there was an airbrush there. So I would bring it home and um, try it out. And I got really to where it was very, very comfortable to use. Now, one theme is the, just the fewer wild animals because they're being pushed and pressed and um, you know pretty soon they their habitat is just getting so small. So how do you really show this, you know? Um, and I know Sonoma County has a lot of uh, ridges and mountaintops that where they talk about these wildlife corridors and you know, I wonder now with all the fires up in these uh, mountainous areas, what's happening with that. But, um, but that's sort of something that I was looking at for quite a while. And I felt like I could do anything with this technique with the airbrush and the painting. This is uh, Stumps to the City. So we know that, um, you know, San Francisco was built on the redwood trees from uh, Mendocino County and probably Humboldt County oh, yeah. and mm -hmm. shipped down in big barges. And uh, so, you know, we need them as a resource, but it's just not always obvious to people where they're all coming from. So, um, you know, and what you were saying, Cindy, about the redwood decking, I mean, there's nothing like it really, you know, but there are synthetics now to be used in the deck floors and things like that. And you know, I really thought that two by fours were going to be made out of steel. It seemed like there was sort of a push for that for a while, but um, I haven't seen that recently. It seems like they're still using, um, you know, Douglas fir, Douglas I guess, fir, yeah. for most of it. Well, this is um, going home and I there was a tree stump that was up in the Sierras I saw that had these two by fours and four by fours nailed onto this stump and it was something so um, just sort of heartbreaking about it because here these lumber they were trying to go home and it was um, <laughs> just really something sort of uh, tragic at the same time. And um, there it was, they wanted to go home to the mother tree. <laughs> well, um, I had, I was teaching, we had moved into town by this time, by the eighties, because we had children, we needed to work. It was real hard staying in a cabin where you'd come home and the place was freezing, just as cold as outside. You'd have to start the fire going again. And um, so we moved into town and life was a lot easier when you had a thermostat. And um, so I wanted to go to San Francisco State and work on my uh, MFA degree. And um, it just seemed like something good, you know, it was important to do for me. And, uh, you know, I had a, a family that was, would help and make the sacrifices they had to make. So that was wonderful. I was teaching and I could take some time off and do that. And at the time, so this was the late 80s, uh, up here was, were the timber wars and um, Redwood Summer. And I would go down to San Francisco and nobody knew anything about it. I mean, it was like I was going to another country. So um, I really wanted to do work that f for my final project that was important to me. And up here, it was Judy Berry and uh, Daryl Cherney. And people were throwing themselves in front of uh, bulldozers and stopping logging. And it was so important at the time, you know, the Stephen Hurwitz had taken over Pacific Lumber. And uh, then it was, you know, all the old growth was, there was this rush to 
log all the old growth. To pay off the junk bonds. To pay off the junk bonds. And also they knew that um, things were going to get tighter as far as logging these old growth. And the spotted owl was this pawn in the middle of it all because fish and wildlife was trying to figure out if it was going to be a um, threatened or if it was going to be endangered. So there were lots of studies going out at they'd go out at night and they would feed them with little mice on their hands and they would watch the spotted owls come down and get the mouse and they could sort of triangulate what which tree it was coming from so that was a nesting tree and then they could decide that there couldn't be any logging within a certain diameter of that tree Mm -hmm. Yeah, after the, the owl li was listed in 1990, it was listed as threatened by the Federal Envi Endangered Species Act. So, right, right. Yeah, and so, and I think it still is. It still is. Oh, yeah, uh, oh, it's still listed, yeah. It still is threatened. It's not endangered, it, but we know that every year it's losing 2 to 3% of its population because it has to nest in old trees that have big hollows in them. So usually that's old growth, not always. It can be, you know, other tall trees. So it's not looking very good for it. And um, also the barred owl is a predator of the spotted owl, even though- It's a, it's a competitor. Yeah. A competitor, yeah. Even though they um, sometimes uh, procreate so that's sort of interesting. But I, you know, it was such a thing. It was like the loggers and the um, environmentalists and right in the middle was the spotted owl. And there was all the, all these uh, posters and the posters were like, you know, buy spotted owl hamburgers. And what is, do you want to eat it? You know, the loggers are going to starve if we don't kill the, if we don't log. And so if the spotted owls are dead, it's all right. You know, it's, it was just real, um, very, you know, very political and um, sort of fascinating. So I did the series of these three pieces that were um, airbrush painted. And, um, you know, so here's the trespasser that you know, it doesn't know what's going on. It's sweating. It's sort of going, oh my God, what's happening? Uh, it's in the middle. Everybody's staring at it with all this attention. And this is about 65 by 51, the size. And this is the, the middle piece. And so the spotted owl gets canned and uh, <laughs> it meets all the saws. And um, it's sort of like uh, it's mouse fed wild and tasty. When you take all the feathers off, it still has spots in it. So it was the, the victim here. And this was the chainsaw bar. And, um, and I have friends in Willits who are loggers and they went to, they grew up here. They went to Berkeley and got their degrees in forestry and came back and they're still here, you know, abiding by all the laws and having small bills. So I looked at a big chainsaw that's really, you know, seven by or nine feet long. So this is very truncated, but um, yeah, and this is big, beautiful object. And at the, I also, when I showed this, I had t-shirts that were silk screened. I had buttons, scapulars, so you two could carry the burden of the chainsaw and the uh, spotted owl. And, you know, and it's been shown in a, a couple of different places. But, you know, after graduate school, I'm sort of thinking, okay, what do I do now? That was such a push, you know, this three years. And uh, uh, I, I, start, I feel like you should really decide what it is you want to do through what is most interesting to you. And um, for me, it was where I lived. And I still didn't know that much about Mendocino County or... Um, you know, the Redwood Empire, as we like to call it. And I started visiting a lot of um, tourist sites or, and uh, driving around, uh, you know, just in taking kids to places where they could go swimming or, uh, you know, you go to the ocean a lot. And um, it was just sort of interesting to see all this old logging, logging towns that were really in 
um, you know, a much reduced state than they had been. And, you know, try to think about what was left and what they were doing there. Like, say, if you go to Oric and you just see these old buildings and, but they're selling lots of uh, chainsaw bears and burls. So they're changing the economy and trying to do something to survive. And I also started buying old postcards on eBay and I could really, really focused on the redwood tree postcards and redwood tourist attractions. And I think I've seen every postcard that's ever been printed and they come up, you know, um, and there's a lot of them out there. So I started buying them and seeing these tourist attractions and how, what they looked like in the twenties, what they looked like in the thirties. And you could tell from the cars sort of what the age was. So that was really sort of fascinating. And, uh, this one is called, this piece is called uh, Carving into the Primordial. I mean, there are no people in here or creatures except in the trees in the back, there are some bears because they're waiting to be cut out with their chainsaw, with the chainsaw art. But there's lots of evidence of uh, human activity. And, um, you know, this stump this down in the lower right was a, uh, a drive-through stump that was in, um, I think, Pepperwood or someplace like that. And it was used as a parking garage for a car. It wasn't a tourist attraction. And then uh, in the 50s, they enlarged a motel. So it was blown up with dynamite. And I just feel like these huge stumps they are slowly dissolving and changing and rotting. And at some point, people aren't gonna realize how big they were because they were just so, so massive, um, you know, that a big old American car could just drive through that. And then I've got burls and I just sort of have fun with uh, the fantasy and the humor and think about the mythology of, um, of what's happening in in the north coast in the where the redwoods are and so i was you know i'm learning how to paint in oil in a way that i hadn't before and uh, you know getting away from fiber and stitching even though i still do some in embroidery but um you know who are all the characters who are out there once you go looking and uh just sort of making it be a fun thing and you know, up in the top right is uh, Bigfoot's legs because he looks just like a tree and then tree creatures and, you know, just sort of trying to find out what's happening out here and why it's so intriguing. Land of Wonder. Now, these are uh, really postcard inspired, like the log in is based on Tharp's log, which is in the Sequoia National Park. And uh, the secret room, there's a, a room called in a tree, I think it's the hidden room, and it has a ladder so you can go inside that. I haven't, I like to go visit these if I can. And I did go to Tharp's Log when I was a kid because I found a, a photograph, but I didn't even know that I had, I knew I had gone to some sort of tree where somebody had lived, but I wasn't sure that that's, that was what it was. Um, and this guy down here is sticking his hand in this, the crack in the world. That's up at Calaveras Big Trees. And then octopus trees, I'll talk about that, those in a minute, because they're, they're really very fun. Yeah, I think, you know, some other things, I mean, besides Bigfoot and there's Chipolope, uh, you know, what are the sort of romantic mythology of this area? It's definitely the old loggers who lived in cabins and hermits. You know, it'd be fun to find out. I'm sure there's lots of other things I don't know about that are living out there in the woods. And, you know, the eels or the lampreys in uh, the Eel River. Now, these are based on the drive through trees, which, and, you know, and this really course has this fantasy to it. Um, 
but we have three drive through trees in this area that you can still drive through and they cost money. They're on private land. And uh, there was probably something wrong with them that they weren't good for lumber, which is why they cut holes and made them work to make money. So uh, the candle tree is the chandelier tree near Leggett. And the lean tree is the tree at Myers Flat, which has had many names, but I think it's called the shrine tree now. And it is going to fall into the Eel River soon because you used to be able to walk around it, but uh, now it's right on the cliff of the Eel River and it's leaning towards it. So uh, I haven't gone to visit there for a while, so I'm not sure. And the, the two or three through tree you don't hear much about, it's not advertised, but it's at Klamath where the uh, river comes into 101 and it's owned by the Klamath Indians. So you can just drive and you'll turn off there at the river just north and you'll find it. And um, let's see, drive on up. That's a, somebody cut a driveway, a parking place into a tree so that you can always park your car there. And the bathroom is in Ukiah at the, um, I guess the Redwood Tree gas station and the one log in, which used to cost a dollar and is in Piercy. It's actually a wonderful place to visit because it's all, you know, carefully handcrafted inside. And these aren't very big. They're like a half sheet of a watercolor paper, a real 300 pound watercolor paper. Yeah. Now the everything tree is uh, oil and it's based on the sacrificial tree that a lot of times you'll find in places, maybe in an old store. This one was at Confusion Hill in the parking lot. And you see these trees like in Leightonville, there was the Shady Nook and it had a tree and everything happens to that tree. I mean, there's lights on them. I mean, this is what they do. They put lights on them, signs on them. Um, people throw things up in them. They're just tons of activity. So I wanted to do that. I wanted to put everything in there, a TV, the marbled mural at, and just everything I could think of that would like being in a tree. And uh, I used some of the signs from Confusion Hill. Uh, the restroom, there was a restroom just like that carved out of a log that was in, um, I think, north of Leggett. You see it in a lot of postcards, the she, he restroom. I, I don't know where, I'm sure it's gone, but Bigfoot uses it a lot. And we have red-legged frogs down here and um, a logger a, with a chainsaw chasing Bigfoot. I was such a tight oil painter and I'm really trying to loosen up, but. Now continuing with um, sort of humor, I'm trying to figure out, you know, what's happening with the trees and uh, humor to me, you can talk about these issues in this sort of softer way. Like, uh, you know, if you can get people to laugh about things and and then maybe you can start a discussion. And then with that discussion, you can bring out all the uh, aspects of some item that you're interested in. So I always wondered, I thought these teepee burners were just really pretty amazing. Uh, you know, there used to be one in Cloverdale. We always had two or three here in Willits and um, you know, now they're all gone They're, And they still use them up until the seventies, I think. And then they, um, they were, uh, you know, forbidden to use them because they would just create too much ash and particles. So they've slowly just decomposed and then they get taken away and nobody ever really, people might not know what they are anymore if they see a picture of them. But I just thought, oh, triangles, there was something so neat about them. So I just did this little painting. But the these little mountain trees on the top left when I was in Oregon, I was amazed at the, a lot of the mountains, they would have these big swaths of clear cutting and then they would have another whole band where it wasn't clear cut. And so you had this patterning going on 
that was very interesting. And, you know, it's like when you fly over all our states here, you see this patchwork of the, what they call selective cutting, where a whole area will be clear cut and then next to it will be solid trees. And so their selective cutting is so unselective. It's like, mm -hmm just you know a huge swath and then another one and uh and we know that you know then the earth just gets so hot and the everything burns and there's just not that much chance for these trees to come back especially if they're just planted all at the same time so oh they can grow back <laughs> they can grow, they grow back. back really fast in fact <laughs> it's pretty and amazing what you were saying about <laughs> They're cutting redwoods and they're replanting with Douglas fir. That was for the Green Diamond Company, yeah, because they lost their market share in redwood lumber. So now they're they're concentrating their efforts on Doug fir. It's interesting. The politics of uh, the timber industry is a fascinating topic. Yeah, to right. Follow. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, you know, what if we could take all these pieces of lumber and nail them back together? So this was a small painting about the strange trees. You know, how can we? Of course, you know, tongue in cheek. Mm -hmm. This is a fiber piece that's um, paint. Oh, somebody asked about when I say stitched and stitched fiber. Another word for it is it's a quilt. So it has three layers and it's there's and it has a batting, a cotton batting, and they're stitched in between. But this, I was doing so much painting on them. Um, you know, they're wall pieces, they're wall art. But this is similar to the, to the animals that they have a smaller and smaller area that is, uh, you know, wild. And so this is our tree park. We only have one big tree left. And that's part of the selective cutting. Sometimes they'll leave these trees that are, that have, um, cone bearing, you know, so they can spread the cones around and, and with the wind, but they're also so weakened by just having one tree there. But we're getting more and more compartmentalized and, um, you know, that's just the way it is. This is even the old growth must work for its keep. <laughs> and this was sort of based on that tree that was in Myers flat because there's no way that they would ever use this for lumber. It's so old, it's so marred. It has this history of being stitched together with, um, you know, pieces of wood and metal to try to keep it going. And, um, you know, it's just in dreadful shape, but it's still making us money every day. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, the, the concept of working forests up here is like so, so prevalent in our region and, and has such a long history, you know, 150 years history of. Really yeah, they have to get money as, Yeah, as being a, a, a monetary enterprise, as being something that right. we gain capital from. So. Yeah. And the Save Our Redwoods League really is doing great things with, um, you know, buying tracks and especially if they can find virgin redwood. So they're really the major force in protecting the redwoods. Mm -hmm. great. Now, I was curious about um, chainsaw bears. These four bears are at Confusion Hill, or they were a long time ago. So, and they're all chained up. They're really like, um, they don't want to be somebody to steal them. But I find them just sort of, you know, I gave them more life than they really had and tried to think about, you know, what's happening with them. But there's the wild bear and uh, doesn't have any clothes on. It's just, you know, primal wild. And there's the sheriff who is going to like keep everybody in line and the poacher with the salmon and the female bear who has a baby and, you know, one female, three men that sort of, that's the way a lot of movies are. And uh, a chipolope. So the Confusion Hill started this story about the chipolope, the chipmunk and the antelope. So that's one of the, um, the local things. And also what you can buy in these tourist shops is sort of interesting, this windscrew, you know, that's sort of made with local wood. 
And um, anyway, I just wondered why I have to talk to a chainsaw artist sometimes to see why people buy the um, the bears, the chainsaw bears. Is it now that the bear has been tamed within this sculpture, we can bring it home, you know, like many things, but we really don't want to see them out in the wild. Or is it just that they're the easiest thing to make? You know, sort of like Bigfoot too. This is when no one is looking. Maybe they have a secret life, I would hope. And down by the river, they're, uh, the mother and the wild bear are having fun. Must be the dad, the wild bear, and the two are fighting with their chainsaws. So I did some other ones of this too. You know, I just want to give you sort of the flavor of it. And you know, it's funny, you think chainsaws are so destructive until you try one, you know, until you learn how to use one and you're like, whoa, power. <laughs> well, the things that they use are these, uh, they're real pointed. <laughs> so they're they powerful, have... amazing devices. <laughs> yeah. right, right. I don't think I've ever, I think I cut something once, but now they have electric ones. Maybe I'd be more inclined to give it a try. <laughs> yeah. So how do you like, um, <clears throat> you know, like, how do you paint a tree? I mean, it's so, um, you know, such a cliche to paint a tree, but there are so amazing, you know, objects to use. But as an artist, you know, what can you do that's different? So I've used sort of fantasy and, um, you know, humor and, you know, it's just, it's something that always comes up, you know, and how can you paint something, even if it's 60 inches high, that's 350 feet high. So, you know, without um, diminishing so much about it. And so this is a watercolor and I sort of decided I would flip it and have um, the, the first rendition is the bottom because it has four uh, holes in it. It was called the quadruped tree with these four feet. And then it was uh, over decades, it was built into an office, which is the, sort of the top part of the tree that it was built by a woman that's in the books. And it's now it's the uh, tree house that was the Ripley's Believe It or Not tree house. And it's a tourist attraction right on the road north of Leggett. And it is actually pretty interesting when it's open, I guess, um, because you go in the gift shop first, then you go into the tree and it's a big burned out tree that's very, very large and has some interesting sort of museum artifacts in the uh, shop, in, in the tree part. Uh, wedding cake. So a lot of the trees, when they're cut, just part of them will fall and then they'll cut it some more. And then we always have that growth that comes out. Not always, but um, this is sort of the beginning of the octopus tree with the roots coming down and looking like octopus legs and going over everything. And then the roots will go down into the earth, but they're probably a different species and not like the tree at the top, not another redwood. Like a Sitka spruce, I think you were saying. Yeah, and I'll show those drawings with the Sitka spruce, yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, here's, this is a fiber piece based on a story. I like to, you know, yeah, I like to sort of get, so if I'm telling a story, it's just usually a story that I'm sort of invested in. This was a, a you know, California red-legged frog. And at night it was being moved from a pond to another sort of marshy pond in Sonoma County. Uh, and this was probably in the eighties. And a, there was a development going in like a strip mall and a uh, environmental consultant who had been hired by the developer was caught at night moving red-legged frogs and had tadpoles and everything. And so he was fined and <clears throat> couldn't, couldn't practice his job for quite a while. I can't quite remember what it was. 
And I'm just sort of showing the frog is going, what? I don't know what's going on. But it's part of the whole uh, mitigation process. Yeah, he's that the frog is uh, being something... weaponized, weaponized yeah, right. by the environment so the, the spotted by the Endangered office. Species Act, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, they don't know what's going on. They're sweating and they're, oh. And, uh, you know, mitigation, like if there had been frogs there, which there were, but it, they probably would have worked something out or moved them or the developer would have had to buy land someplace else. Mm -hmm. But I had just never heard of it and just thought it was, oh my God, you can't, who can you trust? You know, mm -hmm. it's like the environmental developer, in, environmental consultant, you couldn't. And, uh, this was is a drawing, my map of California, according to me, and it's part of the, uh, there's a whole group that I know you all know about it, uh, of maps called uh, cartographs. And um, so they're graphic maps, and they're not at all real. They're just sort of a spoof on um, what's there. I mean, there might be a, you know, there's usually a slant to it. I mean, to me, being a native Californian and growing up in different parts, I, you know, I'm just aware of all these different attractions that uh, we like to go to. So I had fun just making one of these and having the whole thing look like a face and it's looking back to the east and it's sort of punk, but it's got all of the fun and interesting things. And, um, you know, like, Lassen, you know, is uh, smoking because it's a volcano. And um, Mount Shasta has a Lemurian next to it and they live underneath in these caves. And, uh, you know, Bigfoot and the um, California Darlingtonian plants. It's hard to see here, but um, anyway, I like working in pencil too. So this is our area, so. I've got uh, Pelican Bay and then Petrolia, which I don't think they have any more oil wells there. Uh, Ferndale and um, wine, uh, Pomo Basket, things like that. So this, I have a couple of um, octopus tree drawings that I've done. And this is one that's over in Mendocino on a trail that goes up to a waterfall. It's a real big stump with this beautiful Sitka spruce and uh, all the uh, intertwining roots that are going around and the ferns. And it's not that big of a drawing, maybe it's 12 by 12, but um, yeah, just sort of beautiful. And this is one from Prairie Creek Redwoods, which I think are some of the most beautiful redwoods ever. And that trail that goes along Prairie Creek is fabulous. Mm -hmm. That trail from Prairie Creek to Fern Canyon. Oh my God. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I like the one all along the creek, and I've gone on part of that other one. Yeah, but nice um, one. <laughs> the octopus trees are really the sort of local mythology. And if you Google octopus trees, you will get to Pacific Tree Octopus Mythology. So it's a website that is a spoof website and it will tell you all about these octopuses that live in the trees because the branches come down and mingle with the tide pools. And then the octopus climb up and they eat things up in the trees. So it's really sort of a riot to go, um, you know, Look at them. And then you can find old postcards that show octopus trees. And, um, you know, it's one of those things that you discover when you're walking around in the state parks and the national parks in this area. So another mythology. But what will happen is this log eventually will rot out and you'll see the uh, octopus tree is it because spruce just sort of standing there with nothing underneath and then it'll start walking so this last series is um what i've been doing uh recently in the past like eight years or so and i had a couple of people have asked me that 
you know, why did you change from doing these sort of mythology and redwood tree things, and now you're doing something that's much more um, directly connected, realistic but not realistic. And I had really felt that people were getting it, that um, we had all these environmental problems and that more people were believing in uh, global, in, in uh, climate change. You know, I'm not really quite so sure anymore, but, uh, and maybe it was retiring from teaching all the time. I started hiking more and just felt like I could um, wander around with my camera and my sketchbooks and find out what was out there, always surprising things. So I saw, just started, this is from Hendy Woods, this tree. So I keep track of where the, the trees are and um, then photograph them and come home and work on a 30 by 22 sheet of Arches Hot Press. And then some of them will become oil paintings. I'll do that also. So I just became enamored with the big trees that have been burned and how you can go inside them and, and they're all unique and just incredibly beautiful. And uh, this is called Entrance. And those burn marks are evidence of forest fires and wildfires that happened like hundreds of years ago, which is right, yeah. amazing. It's like a record of, of climate in the, in the bark. Right there in the bark, yeah. yeah. And I start painting and I, my colors just sort of go in directions where I'm not sure what I'm doing. So um, it's always sort of a surprise to me. And I just put the watercolor down flat and just sort of let it dry, let it pool. And there's something about the hot press paper as it doesn't absorb right away <clears throat> that I really like the hot press. So it's nice to know that uh, you can, you're still developing as an artist. I mean, and your techniques continue on. There isn't any place where you have to stop. So this one, you can sort of see a little bit more around it and um, and it looks like it's still burning, but it's not. Whoops. And the redwood duff is extremely beautiful. It's, um, you know, paintings within itself already. And it can just be thick and thick, you know. So another interior that was very light. And I'll start getting into like a purple or something. And all of a sudden I'm going into pink. And I don't, I mean, I feel like I don't, can really, control exactly where it's going and I don't want to. And now this is an oil painting. So it just it similar, but it has sort of a heavier feel to it. It also is based on a lot of graffiti because when you go to a place where a lot of people can get to, like a very um, well-trodden path or a loop like Dyerville Loop, say, or um, you will have so many people there. The, that's, those are the places that have all the graffiti. But they have a charm within themselves as we look at it and just think, oh, it's texture or it's, you know, it's added to it. And, you know, under, like the drive through trees, they're totally graffitied inside. Mm -hmm. They're just mm -hmm. like, you know, solid graffiti. Yeah, it's like they're historical documents. <laughs> yeah, right. And when you find old petroglyph, petroglyphs around here and you see, you know, the settlers in the 19th century, they, you know, carved their initials and names into these into stone. Mm -hmm. And I like having a few branches. Sometimes it'll give it scale. Um, this is called proximity. And the, so for some reason, this bark just looks really flowing and very shiny, and, and that's what it was like. And uh, I was asking Linda before about, um, I mean, you can't help it, but to sort of see like female genitalia kind of, you know, a la Georgia O'Keeffe in these images. And, and I was yep. probing a, <laughs> Linda before about your opinion about these, these, you know, obviously really erotic images. It's so sumptuous, luscious, and they do, they're just fabulous, you know. <laughs> I think it's just what, what you want to see in there is what you'll see. 
<laughs> right? What can I say? <laughs> this one is called pareidolia because um, it's really all burned. And a lot of times there are these big orange um, streaks inside and it's part of the bark that has come through or there's just that turn in the color. But pareidolia, I started to see all these little faces in there and it was just the way the burned wood was coming together. And that's a term that's used when we are looking into areas that we're not sure what's there, we'll, we'll try to make sense of it. And so with these, a lot of little faces would come up because we always try to see people, faces, things. It's just a, a, the human condition of trying to make sense of the unknown. So I played that up a little bit, but not too much. This was very smooth, really beautiful. Lots of, and lots of times there's a sort of strip at the bottom that's a different color. But I guess I, you know, by going inside and looking at the section, I'm not thinking of the outside of the tree and I'm not thinking of how tall it is because you can't really see that anyway. I'm just following what I'm interested in, which is yeah, these are, are really patterns in the interior of it. And, you know, I hope it'll make people think about also going and visiting or, you know, finding out more about the redwoods. But they're also such a formalist abstract analysis, so different than your more narrative work of the past. Yeah, That's really right. Interesting about these, these yeah. paintings. And it's like, I don't know, I might go back and do narrative work. Right? Just don't know. I mean, they're, they're you know, this so like, similar oh. to your earlier work and yet so distinct at the same time. So cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, I go inside these and I always uh, look up and photograph the, if I can, the, uh, the interior, the top. And a lot of times it's like this, there'll be something that's a circle and then the rest of the tree is above that. So you're above this massive amount of wood. And, uh, you know, it's just sort of a gargantuan thing to think about that that's where you are inside this. But, uh, and a lot of things are in there that you just don't know about because it's totally dark with no light. But when your flash goes off, it'll illuminate it all. And um, sometimes there's bats in there. Um, this one group in the Dyerville flat loop, they were all in these little circles with their, uh, I think it was their heads or their feet. I can't quite remember, but they were, uh, they're called long-eared bats. I looked them up and um, I didn't know we had those around here. And then on this piece, the bottom that is the redwood color, that's the, um, the, the exterior bark is curving around into the hole that I had just climbed into. So the bark will continue growing and even it's not going to stop right at an edge. It'll keep growing and growing and growing. So it's always um, making these convolutions, which are pretty fascinating. Now, this is something uh, totally different than the, uh, the trees. Uh, when I go on hikes, I always am, uh, you know, sort of attuned to seeing something unusual. So this was at Prairie Creek Redwoods. It was the skunk cabbage trail. And uh, so I was with some friends. And as soon as we started on it, we saw <clears throat> these eggs that were glued onto these zip ties on these branches that were, they were, I don't know, six to seven feet above the ground. And we saw four or five of these trees and they looked like Easter eggs, but they were big. They were like, you know, chicken eggs. So we photographed them and there were no, there was no signage. So we had no idea what this was. And uh, then when we came back and we drove through the south part of Oric is the visitor center, we went there and um, because we went to the small visitor center at the Prairie Creek and they didn't know anything about it. So we talked to the ranger and he said, oh, Humboldt State has a program and they were, are trying to train the corvids in the area. So that's the ravens, the crows, the stellar's jay, the scrub jays, and 
I don't know if there's anything else. They're trying to train them not to eat eggs that they find in trees. And what they do is they blow out the eggs and they put something in there that is, or maybe they just inject it into the egg to add to it. I'm not quite sure about that. But they see, they have sort of a little plug at the end. So it's an emetic. It's going to make the bird feel sick and it will throw up the egg. So they're, they're doing that so that as the corvid starts at the bottom of the tree and goes all the way up to the top where the marbled murrelet eggs will be, it will realize that it doesn't want to eat eggs anymore because they make them sick. So this is um, just a way to train these corvids to not eat marbled murrelet eggs or any other eggs that are there in the tree. And, uh, and he said, and it has been successful. So they're going to extend the, um, this experiment in other state parks and national parks. So I just thought that was great. We <laughs> thought it was really neat. And he said that the, those corv the corvids are increasing because they like the edges. They like where the, uh, the meadows and the grasslands come in, into the woodlands. And as there are fewer woodlands, there's more of these edges. So they're increasing up there. Um, and then at this time I had a, um, let's see, there was an exhibit Envoy show that was being created where they um, asked artists from different areas, who artists who dealt with ecology issues to make some work for this particular show that was going to travel um, around the state. And it was called Ignite, the Art of Sustainability. So I, I had three or four paintings that were on this topic and some others in the woods that were in that show and it traveled to many sort of small museums in California for a couple of years. So that was a great experience. Anyway, I'm done with the main slides and now I just have three more of the political signs when my friends and I marched in San Francisco and in Oakland. And uh, we had, it was lots of fun and really good to do, to, to do that march. So you saw the first one, the don't frack with mother earth. So these are some of my friends mm -hmm. and um, yeah, I just, I went on three marches. They went on more. I also have one that says um, vaginas vote. <laughs> <laughs> and this one, Mother Earth came and walked with us for a while. So that was fun. And we didn't know her, but we had a great time talking with her. Yeah. I and that's... You. I love these signs because they really like integrate your artistic practice and your your activist your activist yeah right and yeah your advocacy yeah. for for various social uh -huh. and ecological issues it's so cool yeah and because we had really spent time painting these a lot of people looked at them and uh, and they're two sided so you can you know so we would stop and then turn them and people would take photos so we had a great a great time oh I might have I think I have one more actually. Oh yeah, this is, we'd usually take the subway mm -hmm. over. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's it. And um, yeah, I mean, we can have some questions and um, or whatever, I guess. Uh, Cindy, how do you want to do this? Oh yeah, we can have questions. I was just thinking about a few things when you were giving your awesome presentation. One is I really love your um, your fascination for satire and for history and for mythology. And I think these are these are sites where controversial issues can sort of have common ground with different types of perspectives, like for, from a logger's perspective or an environmentalist perspective. I mean, both people can both types of political persuasions can can find common ground in in satire and humor and history and allegories. Yes, so right. I, I think that your 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 emphasis on on treading the uh, treading the line between polarized politics it, by various means 
is, is a really fascinating one. I mean, I've always sort of been interested in that, that, that really um, delicate, precarious line mm -hmm. between polarized positions on, on topical and critical issues. So I just find that your, your use of satire in particular is, is um, very potent that way. So. Mm -hmm. Thank you. What, and, and one thing is it's not really based on um, realism. It's just, it's all sort of fantasy. I mean, as far as the images, you know, like now I'm photographing trees. Well, when I was doing the uh, more of the humor, it was just all from my mind, you know, working in sketchbooks. So I don't know if that makes any difference, but mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and uh, let's see. Oh, also, especially your, your latest painting about that, your recent painting about the eggs and the trees and, and how that they make the, the corvids throw up. <laughs> I love that. Oh, right. I do. <laughs> because the modest infrastructure of ecological restoration is so interesting to me because it is so uncanny to see like PVC piping or plastic eggs in the middle of a forest yeah. you know, e ecosystem. And you wonder what the heck are these things doing here? And then, you know, upon further investigation, you realize that Yes, there are uh, environmentalists, there are researchers, there are uh -huh. people who are seriously focused on, on helping species and sometimes very simple things like a plastic egg filled with an emetic, you know, can yeah. save a, an endangered species like a marbled murrelet. So uh -huh. I just love the, the really modest ways that, that researchers can make enormous strides in saving species. And yeah, the uncanny event of just happening across these you know, these yeah, little right. infrastructure, this very yeah. modest, very, you know, in, in seemingly insignificant infrastructure in our environment, mm -hmm. which really has a lot of power and a lot of capacity mm -hmm. to save, save animals' lives. So it's really cool. Yeah, and working together. So you have science and um, the artist, <clears throat> you know, and ecology and it's all, and the birds, you know, that's really what we have to do is, uh, work together on solving these problems or helping with them young. Yeah. I just want to interject and say, sure. Linda, we have a question in the chat from Belinda. Oh, and uh -huh. she oh, asked no. and about the uh, overstory. Yes, yeah. I did read it. And I try to read a lot of uh, sort of nature, environmental novels and um, yeah, re really, really very, very good. So. Yeah, and I wanted to say to our participants, if you have a question, you can write it in the chat or just hit unmute um, and ask the question when you're ready. Yeah, anybody can just speak up. Mm -hmm. Do you have any questions? Um, I, I have a question. My name is Iris. Uh, is there somewhere I can see any of this art? Is it hanging somewhere? Publicly. Oh, uh, my website you could look at. Okay. Yeah. I, and currently the art is available virtually at the College of Redwoods Gallery. Um, I'm going to put that link in the chat here. Um, so it's online in the link that I'm about to send everyone the virtual exhibition Trouble Under the Big Trees. So, and also, Iris, we hope after the after the conclusion of the pandemic to <laughs> have Linda's work yeah. back at the gallery at College of the Redwoods. So eventually, our you know we will get a vaccine, everybody. Hopefully, <laughs> of course we will. <laughs> and yes. we'll be able to uh, to exhibit uh, work in the physical gallery space again, and yeah. we will we will feature feature Linda's work in an exhibit at that time. So. I also have a comment. I, I think that the beginning with the quilts and the ending with the very large on almost abstract and somewhat geometrical paintings of the trees, um, they, wow. they have a lot in common. I, I, I wonder if you think so, the yeah. artist, do you think so? Oh, uh, thank you. I like that. I like that. Um, I mean, they're large and um, have lots of, I mean, I love all the different colors and the pieces and that, but I haven't really put that together, but I like that um, analogy. Yeah, thank you. I, yeah, I think they're very yeah. beautiful. Yeah. yeah, oh, great. 
Yeah, I mean, they're realistic, but they're abstract, but they're not purely abstract. I'm not quite sure where they are in that spectrum, but I'm just the, the tree that I'm enjoying doing, you know, the trees are blown, they're blown up, which makes them almost look up. Yeah, they're blown they're up. Right. Yeah, uh -huh. yeah. Right, and a lot of them are actually really the size that they are, you know, in reality, but I perceive the colors and the textures and sort of do my own thing with using them as a source. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but thank you. Yeah. Great work. Thank you. Uh -huh. And also, Linda, can you tell us a little bit about your influences as an artist? Because you are really omnivorous, I think, uh, in your style. Okay. Yeah, you have this omnivorous <laughs> style where you're interested in, in craft and, and interested in cartooning and satire and illustration and, and more formalist painting strategies, too. Uh -huh. so, yeah, there's just a, a lot of different sources that you're and also interest in, in Americana and kitsch and mythology. And right. you know, it's really, yeah, it's a fascinating pastiche of influences. Can you tell us a little uh -huh. bit more about what inspires you as an artist? What other artists or other, well, I mean, you have you have talked a lot about your environment, the environment of the Redwoods, of course, up here, the great Redwood Empire is being a, a huge source of inspiration, but what about other artists? So um, one of my favorites of all time is Charles Birchfield, oh, gotcha. uh, who lived in uh, upstate New York or near Buffalo. And I just, I mean, he would really go out and paint. He started out as a illustrator and made wallpaper and just, you know, worked and worked and uh, supported himself and did nature. He was always outside and uh, but and really abstracted the landscape. And and then in his later years, he really put his spirit, his soul into everything. And he painted what you couldn't see. I mean, he faint, painted the air and the bugs and how they were flying through the the air. And they, you know, they we would call them psychedelic, you know, here, but uh he was this very staid, you know, hardworking. Uh, middle-class artist who was just fabulous. So um, yes, he did make wallpaper. He worked at a wallpaper firm for quite a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, but I have like three or four of his books and I periodically just look at them and get so inspired, you know. And then a woman named Wanda Gog, who was an illustrator and she made the uh, books uh, hundreds and hundreds of cats or is it millions and millions of cats but she did just wonderful uh, graphics and um, her work there's a great book of her work and she's sort of forgotten but um, I really really liked her um, yeah there's just so many great artists out there really quite quite a few and Roger Brown yeah, totally. Yeah, Birchfield. Oh my gosh. I worship Birchfield. I, I can totally yeah. see the influence. Yeah, and Roger Brown, I thought, would take these uh, these issues and he would cartoonize everything mm -hmm. and uh, was really very sort of hard edged too, but they had such humor and, um, you know, it's, it's just sad that he left us so young, but uh, he was really, he was one of the Chicago imagists. So, and, and I, you know, all of them were really fabulous too. So, um, but yeah, I think Charles Birchfield is my favorite for now, you know. Mm -hmm. I have another question. Sure. I, was one, I was wondering if it, you're at all inspired by surrealism. I thought I saw some surrealistic stuff in there, like a little bit Magritte or something. Oh, good question. Yeah, I mean, surreal being more than real. I mean, you see, yeah have this freedom to do whatever you want to do. And, you know, maybe some of my, um, like the triangles and different, but I've never felt the uh, connection to dreams, to dream imagery. And um, so that just hasn't been alive for, for me. Um, but I certainly love looking at all of their work and uh, especially some of the uh, people who went to Mexico and uh, worked down there. That was just really um, Remedios of Art. Um, Remedios of Art, yeah. Yeah, that was wonderful. There's What's the name? Books. Remedios of I'll write it in the, in the chat. Yeah. Varro. 
Yeah, V A R O is our last name. Um, yeah, you know, yeah, all of them were great. Max Ernst and the data is I read a biography of uh, Marcel Duchamp that was wonderful. So I didn't know much about him. Yeah, I can totally see the influence of Birchfield, especially in those that tick motif, you know, of all the ticks and the yeah, stuff. Uh -huh. and it's just right. so charming and so horrific at the same time. I love it. I love right. that contrast between humor and and just yeah, I know. Disgust. <laughs> it's just great. I haven't seen anybody else paint ticks, but I think it would be interesting. It's a part of our life here, right? I think, yeah. I think <laughs> nobody really does ticks like you do, Linda. Yeah. <laughs> and they are okay. Okay. so ubiquitous in our environment, and they're so frightening because of Lyme disease. And right. Yeah, yeah. it's just really great. I think the ticks are amazing. <laughs> uh -huh. Brilliant. Yeah. Totally brilliant. <laughs> so, uh, Birchfield uh, mainly worked in watercolor his whole life. So mm -hmm. it's interesting. And he would he would paint something and then years later he'd add a piece of paper to it with glue and paint more. And then he'd add another piece over here. So that was it was really interesting. Yeah. Yeah, he, he had a retrospective at the Hammer Museum in Los Angeles several years ago. It was just an astonishing. Oh, such uh -huh. a good show. Yeah. yeah. Really so Cindy, what do you know about the um, how they're uh, they're starting these redwood trees, baby redwood trees, and they're going to move them up into Oregon because of climate change? Um, so are they trying to buy land there, or is uh, maybe save our redwoods? I mean, how can yeah. they? Do you know yeah, anything more about that? that? I, that this was based on Steve Sillett's research at HSU, um, uh -huh. and uh, indeed, they're going to have to, the Redwoods are going to have to, in the long term, find climate refugia, like many animal and plant species are going to need. Um, they're going to need cooler coastal environments, and so the plan is to possibly transplant Redwood seed, seedlings north of the Oregon border, um, to cooler regions because the southernmost range of the redwoods around Monterey and Santa Cruz and Big Sur, are, yeah. and Big Sur are just going to get too hot. It's it, and the fog is is not going to be able. It, it's the fog is not going to be sustainable because redwoods yeah. are so dependent upon fog for precipitation in the summertime. So um, right. yeah. yeah, it's uh, it's the lack of fog. Um, in addition, I mean, they can they can take hotter temperatures. It's amazing the resilience from this research that I was reading just before this talk, that the 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 boring that they've been doing inside these ancient redwoods are are records ex exhaustive like climate records that go back up to two thousand years. Mm -hmm. And so they understand that these redwoods have dealt with severe drought in the past and severe heat in the past as well. Mm -hmm. But the the pace of the climate changing, has never been this accelerated before. And so in order to save the redwoods in the long term, we really have to think about with many species, moving them to higher elevations like the salmon, the research, what I'm researching now, uh, the coho and the, and the Chinook salmon, especially the spring run Chinook salmon have to be allowed to inhabit and, and spawn in higher elevation streams where it oh. will be cooler in the longer term. Oh, yeah. So um, similarly with the redwood forest, they're just going to have to be manually moved north yeah, because right. the climate is changing so quickly that they're not going to be able to reseed on their own. They won't be able to make the move without human intervention, which is uh -huh. an astonishing idea. And it's 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 terrifying and it's gratifying that there are actually there are people there are people and researchers that are thinking are working on this, that. Yeah. working on this and thinking that far ahead. Yeah. for the future of the of the sequoia semper virus the coastal redwoods so yeah, yeah it's really interesting stuff we used to uh, have um redwoods in the santa monica mountains yeah i saw you but i'd never heard of that yeah that's there is records of that i mean there's actually i think one or two redwoods currently in topanga canyon oh uh, they, don't, they might have been planted though they're planted yeah they don't grow very well but they they are there but no they um you know, I don't know if it was a thousand years or you know, fifteen hundred years, but mm. there is record of it that they were throughout the Santa Monica yeah. Mountains. And um, people are trying to plant them all over the world. 
you know, in England and, you know, all mm. over they have them. So, um, and, and they were once ubiquitous, I mean, all over the world, and, you know, hundreds of millions of years ago, you know, they're a really ancient species. So, right. yeah, it's fascinating, you know, to learn more about the history. I mean, here they are right outside my window, and I, I haven't really thought that seriously about them until your work, you know, and, and this talk sort of inspired me to investigate a little bit further. So, thank you, Linda. <laughs> uh, thank you. Yeah. So many more questions. And if you know of any other mythology that um, I'm lacking. <laughs> I think you covered a lot. <laughs> I keep looking like, have you seen any octopus, octopuses up in the trees? Yeah, I, yeah, I think I have. The Sitka spruce growing on the, you know, the mother, the mother uh, stumps. You know, oh, uh-huh, right. To I provide mean, it, so much they, nourishment for so many they could species. crawl from the tide pools up into the trees <laughs> and find, I don't know, something growing up. I don't know if I've seen that. <laughs> I'm really happy to have that new way of looking at those roots growing over the stumps. Yes, right. And Calling them know. octopi, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, does anybody know of a uh, area called Skeleton Park that was north of Crescent Because I have some postcards and they say Skeleton Park like it's a state park and there's some fabulous old stumps there and the last time i was in crescent city i asked somebody and they said they'd never heard of it and i showed them the postcards and they said nope i have no idea so it was probably you know part of some other park now or something or maybe but you guys haven't heard of it you live further north <laughs> Are there any more questions for Linda? I have a question. Oh, good, hi. <laughs> what is this burning tree behind you? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> yeah, right, Cindy? <laughs> it's very worrisome. <laughs> this, okay. This yeah. is um, a, uh, an image from Big Basin State Park from last summer. And I swiped it off the San Jose Mercury News site. Oh. And um, it actually demonstrates an old growth, there it is, wait, <laughs> an old growth redwood that's surviving fire that, you know, because there was so much concern when Big Basin caught fire this summer that the um, old growth redwoods would be destroyed, but they survived the fire because they're, they're adapted for long-term survival. But I had never before seen an old growth redwood actually on fire before I found this video clip. Well, so, wow. so this is from August. This, this is from August. August. Yeah. yeah, this is from just last August. So, right. well, would been... that would that fire be then inside there for a long time, even if because the around it, the forest around it isn't burning. Right, and, and the tree isn't burning. The rest of the tree, the yeah, the the inside the tree. But yeah, the 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 interior of the of the wood can actual or the interior of the tree can actually burn because the cambrium is located between the heartwood and the and the bark, so it doesn't kill the tree. The right. interior can be completely burned out, and but the tree doesn't uh, doesn't get get. Does it does it burn all the way up to the top so that it makes a flue out? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would called, be cool. Those are probably not. <laughs> They're, They're called not, chimney but... trees. Hmm? They're called They're chimney what? trees because that does happen to some of them. They're oh, called right. chim chimneys later. Chimney but, trees. Yes. But I don't know how they. I guess eventually they just go out. The, the yeah. Fire, but. Because we've oh. seen, if, if you've hiked on the trails, and, and Linda's paintings demonstrate that the interiors of these trees have been burned out for centuries. Yeah, right. And, and they survive. It's a miracle. It's, yeah. I mean, it's absolutely amazing. And yeah, Lulu, I just had never seen, I'd seen the remnants of, of uh, redwood tree fires, but I've ne I'd never seen the interior of one actually burning before right. I happened upon yeah, that. Yeah, I hadn't either, so. And then I, play, I played it as a loop for my backgrounds. <laughs> it's great. You should put it. It's like having right. a fake fireplace. Yeah, totally. <laughs> the Yule log. Right. Or I can do like this and like look like a witch, you know? Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, you didn't you didn't show your newest painting. Oh, um, you mean the one I'm working on now? Right, the one behind you on the wall. It's not done. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> Is that the one you sent me? Yeah, but it's I'm I'm letting it dry and I'm going to paint. It's going to be much more yellow in the background. Oh, okay. I, it needs to be lighter. Okay. So it's not, and then I have to photograph it. So. Right. Yeah. Okay, I guess we're um. I guess we're ending. Are we signing off, Cindy? Um. Yeah, I think people are starting to to say their farewells. It, yeah. Are there any, we're just about at time, but if there's any, any remarks that anybody wants to make okay. or any last well, well, It says 34 okay. chat. Did we uh, answer those? Uh, there were, yeah, people signing off. Saying, oh, okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. This yeah, was I just want to thank everyone so much for coming and, and yeah. thank you so much to Linda for sharing your work. Yeah. It, it's just really beautiful. Oh, great. Beautiful and, this it's was so fabulous. Thank you. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank you. Definitely. Thank you, yes. Thank you to Ruth and to Cindy for being such great hosts. So really, Cindy and I worked a long time on figuring this out. <laughs> She's experienced and I'm not. So this was great. Yeah, we're all learning Zoom. <laughs> we're all learning. Yes. yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I hope that, I hope you put on more of these. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. Yeah. Well, I think you're going to have more virtual shows, right? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, we are, and this is the start of you know, with the time, the start of uh, virtual events for the gallery. So great. Right. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, everyone. Right. Bye, everybody. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Ruth. Okay. Too. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. All right. Okay. Thanks again Bye, for coming, Annie. everyone. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye, Iris. Bye, Louis.